Good evening, I'm Adrienne Arsenault. And I'm Andrew Chang. Tonight, Canada's first case of coronavirus unconnected to foreign travel. There's likely at least one other person out there and we need to find them. What you need to know about so-called community spread. If they're unable to hit that 25% target, we will look at all options. Ottawa's plan to get phone companies to lower your bill. Abducted as retribution. A dramatic development in an Ontario Amber Alert case. And CBC News investigates a Canadian crisis. Women after they've left are actually at the highest risk of being killed. Putting a human face on the desperate lack of support for victims of domestic violence. This is The National. For the very first time in this country, someone has tested positive for the coronavirus without any link to travel. It's evidence that community transmission could now be happening in Canada. That new case is one of eight announced today in British Columbia and 13 new ones in total for Canada. The others are in Ontario, Quebec and Alberta. But unlike those patients, no one knows where the BC patient picked up the virus. As Tina Lovegreen tells us, the search is on. A huge uptick in cases in BC. We do have eight actually new cases uh, within the last day. But the number that has health officials most concerned is one, one particular case, a woman with no travel history. So now we need to find out, okay, she hasn't traveled. Um, there's nobody in her family, immediate family that's traveled. So where did she pick this up? This is Canada's first apparent case of the COVID-19 virus spreading in the community. There's likely at least one other person out there who's either had this disease or has this disease and we need to find them. Four of the new cases announced today are linked to the same household and to a patient who was identified last week, a man in his 60s who had traveled from Iran. And they had been under observation and monitoring and they developed their symptoms well in isolation. Another man and woman have also tested positive upon returning from Iran, bringing the total number of cases linked to that country in this province to 13. And the last case is a visitor from Seattle, where 11 people have died from the virus. The campus is closed. We have no idea what's happening. In Vancouver, students showed up at this private university to find it closed at least until March 8th after a student came down with what's believed to be COVID-19. Well, I definitely have concerns now. <laughs> I mean, uh, at least the least that you can say is everyone uses the elevator and touches the buttons, right? The university says the student's father recently tested positive for the virus and had traveled from overseas. So eight new cases, one of them of unknown origin. Does that change, Tina, the way BC officials are responding? Well, we'll find out more about that tomorrow. They're holding a briefing to discuss how they're going to respond. BC now has 21 cases, the most severe, a woman in her 80s who's in critical condition at the hospital. Now, despite this new case of apparent community transmission, the worry is still from abroad. The province's top doctor warning that international travel is risky. All right, Tina, thanks very much. One of the new Ontario cases is linked to a cruise ship being held off the coast of California. On it right now, hundreds more Canadians, and it's feared the virus, too. As Kim Brunhuber tells us, with people showing symptoms on board, testing is now underway. The passengers had no idea. As they lined up to board the Grand Princess, they didn't know that several passengers had just gotten off who later tested positive for coronavirus. On Wednesday, one of them died. Only then did health authorities announce that he could have infected other passengers, like Maggie Hartle. I don't know if, if I'm sick, if I'm negative, positive, I don't know. That's what I have. That's the worry that I have. Meanwhile, there are 3,500 or so passengers still at sea, including at least 235 Canadians. No one's coming ashore until authorities can confirm who's sick and who isn't. We have a number of passengers and crew members that have developed symptoms uh, on this cruise. Uh, uh, ship. So this morning they dropped about 200 test kits on board. The samples will be flown back in batches to a lab near San Francisco. Many passengers stuck in limbo say they're scared and confused. We've been told now to evacuate the areas of uh, the, the decks and such. So we're in our rooms and apparently just heard that we'll be in our rooms till the uh, ship is docked. Everything was running through my head and I don't want to go yeah. home. I don't want to go home to my family because I don't want to take anything to them. Right. I don't want to take it to my city. 
An outbreak on another Princess cruise ship off the Japanese coast infected more than 700 people and killed six. Canadian officials are not keen to have mistakes repeated. Those lessons will all be learned and, and we, we will do what is necessary to protect Canadians' interest and Canadians' health and safety um, on that ship and right across Canada. Authorities say they don't yet know how long the Grand Princess will remain at sea. They say they're still trying to come up with a plan. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, Los Angeles. At least 12 people have now died from the coronavirus outbreak in the United States. All but one of those cases are in Washington state. That's where U.S. Vice President Mike Pence was tonight to meet with the state's governor. But as Stephen D'Souza explains, the U.S. government's response is facing heavy criticism. On a machine like this, we could do several hundred to a couple thousand a day. But right now, there's no COVID-19 yeah, test for these fully automated machines. A slow government response means labs like this are limited to slow manual tests. You know, in retrospect, you always think you could have done things better than they've been done. And, uh, you know, I think everybody would say that right now. Critics say a lack of widespread testing is the government's biggest failure. In February, the Centers for Disease Control sent out flawed tests. It also initially refused to test anyone without a link to the original outbreak sites. That only changed this week. We're in such a crude state of affairs with developing our ability to do surveillance and diagnosis. It's, it's pathetic. She says the Trump administration's slashing of public health budgets is partly to blame, but also a president who downplays the threat. A lot of people will have this, and it's very mild. For days, the vice president has promised more tests are coming, but today in admission. We don't have enough tests today uh, to meet uh, what we anticipate will be the demand going forward. We're the one that's always going out telling other countries what to do and how to do it in an epidemic. And we're, <laughs> we're just lost. Having been achieved, the bill is passed. Today, the U.S. Senate passed an $8.3 billion COVID-19 emergency measure, which includes money to develop quicker testing. It all needs to happen pretty quickly. It all costs money. So the more resources we have, uh, the better we'll be able to do that. And there's another challenge. Millions of Americans lack health insurance. So will they even seek testing? We have no clue how widespread this virus is in America. We have absolutely no idea. The only thing experts can safely say, more tests are sure to reveal more cases. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, New York. Okay, I think now would be a good time for a little bit of perspective. Joining us right now, Dr. Colin Lee, who's an infectious diseases specialist. And so, Dr. Lee, what do you make of all of this? But I'm thinking particularly the fact that we do have this first case of community transmission within Canada. So what that means now is that the virus uh, can now spread invisibly without us being able to identify people who have traveled. Uh, and this is a bit of a sentinel event because now we're not in containment mode really anymore. We're going to be going into delaying or slowing down the spread. And explain that for me. I mean, what does it mean in terms of how we as individuals, but also on a community level, we ought to be and will be preparing for this? Right. So I think what we can see now is that there's possibilities of cancelling of mass gatherings, potentially school closures, and the number of cases will likely start to increase faster. And, and those measures are all, in your mind, just prudence. It's not panic. Those are the things that you would expect to see over the next little while. That's right. This is expected. We've been waiting for this. And this is our time to try to curb it. Is there a risk of overreacting, though? I mean, and you and I have talked about this phenomenon of, of social contagion, right? I mean, right. Explain that for me. Yeah, so the social contagion that we've been seeing recently is the phenomenon of some people emptying shelves to stockpile and people who otherwise wouldn't be doing such uh, behavior are seeing it on social media and they've been infected with that uh, behavior. And so, so what would you have the takeaway be for folks who are watching, I mean, this interview, but, but also the developments that have been happening over the last 24 hours? Right. So this is the time to... Uh, Ensure that your family, your friends, your neighbors know that you can lean on each other. Uh, you're going to look at your, uh, your household and try to get uh, your supplies um, ready for the next uh, couple of weeks. And buy those 
gradually, not necessarily Ex all exactly. in one fell swoop. Yeah, we still have time. Dr. Lee, thanks very much. Now, with coronavirus cases climbing, a lot of people are crossing travel right off their itineraries. And that, according to industry experts, could mean a huge financial hit for airlines. This would be a revenue shock equivalent to what was seen in the global financial crisis. In about 10 minutes' time, we're going to go through what travelers should know about changes by Canadian airlines and insurance companies, too. Turning now, though, to our special CBC News investigation on domestic violence in Canada. Widespread, often invisible, with at least 100,000 victims every year, about 90 of whom are killed by their abusers. For months, CBC News and Radio Canada closely examined intimate partner violence in cities all across Canada. Tonight, we start unpacking those findings, beginning with Erica Johnson's look at a shelter system almost hopelessly overwhelmed. Get the f*** out here. I'm, like, scared stiff. Michelle secretly recorded her now former partner raging, wanting to document his behavior. Hard to watch. Yeah. Things unraveled, she says, when he started drinking every night, would call her worthless, stupid, grab or push her. I worried that he would escalate and harm me in a way that I would regret for the rest of my life. For months, she said she tried to get away, called half a dozen shelters for victims of domestic violence. All were full. Last November, CBC News contacted every Canadian shelter for women fleeing violence, heard back from 60%, and learned those shelters turned women and children away almost 19,000 times that month. It, it, it's shameful. And the number of people turned away each day is growing, up 69% between 2014 and 2018. Transitionals? It takes a toll on shelter workers, um, too. We don't have space right now. Frontline staff at this shelter just outside Vancouver turn away up to 35 women daily. It affects me um, every day when I, you know, when I have to turn a woman down. I, you know, I spend hours thinking what could I have done differently to, to help her. What's needed, say women's advocates, is a coordinated federal-provincial plan to provide more safe housing and more resources to run those shelters. We strongly feel that the services available to women, as well as the levels of protection, shouldn't depend on their postal code. And that is very much the case today. We need policies to change. Michelle is writing her MP, calling for action. She finally got into a shelter last month, but has to move out soon, make room for the next woman in crisis. Monday is in three days. Yeah. And you have no place to go? No place to go. Erica Johnson, CBC News, Vancouver. So clearly emergency shelters are key, but to break the cycle of violence, victims need more time. Still ahead, our special series on intimate partner violence examines the desperate need for longer term second stage shelter and how hard it is to get. Well, there's been a shocking development tonight in an Ontario Amber Alert. Police believe a 14 year old boy was abducted over a drug debt owed by his stepbrother. Ali Chiasson has the late details. We believe that Shema was abducted as retribution for an unpaid drug debt. Shama Joliemi has been missing since yesterday morning, and police believe the 14-year-old boy is being held as collateral. Investigators believe that Shama's brother, Ola Lekin Osakoya, owes a large debt in relation, in relation to a multi-kilo cocaine rip and has since fled the GTA. Police have been in contact with Joliemi's stepbrother, but they still don't know where Shama is or if he's okay. So the Amber Alert remains. This is a 14-year-old innocent child. He is not a part of that business. He's not a part of that lifestyle. And I'm saying the full weight of the Toronto Police will be brought to bear and will push forward on this case. A burned out black Jeep Wrangler was found abandoned in a town 60 kilometers away. The same one seen on security footage outside the boy's home where he was taken from. 
It's very weird to hear that in this complex. In the area, you know, it's a, a little bit uh, dangerous, but around here, ne nothing like that have ever happened before. Just return, but the kid release him, and let's try and solve the problem. Don't take him life. Police say the stepbrother's drug debt is huge and stems from one deal that went wrong. It was in the summer of 2019 that this occurred, and it's, I can tell you, it's in the area of 100 kilos, which is approximately $4 million. Detectives say they have communicated with Joliemi's abductors. I'm not going to speak to the actual substance of that communication. But is he still alive? I believe that he is, yes. I believe that he is. The investigation presses on. Ali Chiasson, CBC News, Toronto. Well, it's been nearly two months since Iran shot down Ukrainian Airlines Flight 752, killing 176 people, most of them either Canadian citizens or people with ties here. Now, Ashley Burke brings us the story of one victim's family who says in Iran, their grief and anger has made them targets of the state. This grieving family says they were silenced by threats at home, so they came to Canada to be heard. They fled from Iran because they had no other choice. Their only tie to Canada, Amir Hossein Saidinia, their 25-year-old son, on his way to Alberta to start his PhD, when Iran shot his plane, Ukraine International Airlines Flight 752, out of the sky. Amir Hossein, we were all relying on him. He was like a mountain. Just imagine if you lose your highest hope. Amir Hossein's hope was to become a Canadian citizen and support his family, especially his little brother, who has autism and needs extra care. Members of the family say they challenged the Iranian regime. The mother captured on social media on the streets of their hometown in anguish, demanding answers. The family says the regime targeted Amir Hossein's aunt. The worst things that can happen to a, to a person within those 24 hours that they arrested me for, they did to me. She says Iran's Revolutionary Guard detained her, abused her and threatened her life. The family said they had no choice but to flee the country. With the help of some Iranians in Edmonton, they got a visitor's visa to Canada and arrived last week. I hope for them to get closure and I definitely want to see them safe. I would not want them to see, I don't want to see them go back and I believe every human being is entitled to safety and to justice. The family wants to stay here. If we are ever forced to go back to Iran, we're all going to have to commit suicide because there's nothing else left for us to do. They're calling on the Prime Minister for help. Canada says there must be justice for the victims of Flight 752. The family says they can only find that justice here in Canada. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. Thousands of migrants are still massed along the border between Turkey and Greece, stuck in the middle of a showdown involving multiple governments. Thousands are concentrated near the city of Edirne. And while those migrants deal with violence, hunger and cold, politicians argue about their fate. Margaret Evans is there. For Turkey, the crisis on one border with Syria has created another here on its northern border with Greece. The floods of refugees the Turkish president threatened to unleash on Europe unless it did more to help now remain trapped, repelled by Greece and refused back by Turkey. Today, the Turkish interior minister, Suleyman Soylu, was up in a helicopter. He's ordered a thousand soldiers to the border to reinforce it. Has Turkey contributed to the crisis here by saying that the borders are going to be open for Europe? Europe has created this crisis, he said. We are hosting four million refugees. He also says Greece doesn't have the right to turn people back. But that's exactly what Greece is doing, even in the quiet places. In a village called Doiran, the river marks the border. We find a charity handing out not just food, but shoes and pants to people from Syria and Afghanistan. They say Greek border guards stripped them of their belongings last night when they tried to cross the river. They take our shoes, our pants, our everything, ID cards, monies. We have nothing. Aid worker Ali Duma blames the European Union for not helping Turkey and the world for not helping Syria. 
where more than one million people, again displaced by fighting, are crammed up against the Turkish border, many without shelter. If the kids are dying under the olive trees, this is a crime against humanity, he says. We have to stop what's going on in Syria. Today, at a meeting in Moscow, the Turkish president Recep Tayyip Erdogan and his counterpart Vladimir Putin agreed to try and enforce a ceasefire in Idlib, the last remaining rebel enclave in Syria. But that's a story that's been written and unraveled before. Margaret Evans, CBC News, Northern Turkey. Well, your cell phone bill could soon see a price cut. We're confident that our 25% commitment is a serious commitment. Later, how the federal government plans to take on the country's big three providers. Plus, finding help in remote communities. I had to change everything if I wanted a different life. We continue our special series on intimate partner violence with a look at the challenges in Canada's north. And a birthday wish come true. I saw a lot of people, and I got a lot of time to. He asked for 100 cards, but guess how many Canadians actually sent him? We're back in two. As you've heard, Canada now appears to have a case of the coronavirus being transmitted within the community. That patient is in British Columbia. But all of Canada's other cases are related to travel. As Alison Northcott shows us, that has some cutting back on flying, and the airline industry is worried. Thank you. Tanya Grant is heading home from a work trip that could be her last one for a while. I worked for a bank and we just recently received a notification saying that all discre discretionary travel could and should be reconsidered. With travel restrictions or advisories in place for several countries, the global airline industry is bracing for major losses. We could see the effect on revenues uh, exceed 100 billion. You know, this would be a revenue shock equivalent to what was seen in the global financial crisis. In the U.S., United Airlines says it's cutting 20% of its international flights and 10% of domestic ones, and one already struggling U.K. airline folded in the face of declining demand. Just all really sad, aren't we? <laughs> Just really sad. Air Canada and WestJet say they're adjusting policies to give some travellers flexibility to change or cancel tickets. But two Canadian insurance companies say they won't cover new customers cancelling trips because of the outbreak. Nobody planned this. This airline industry expert says there's a ripple effect too. You're talking about at least you know, double or triple that amount of revenue loss from organisations that support the travel industry. So things like hotels, limousine companies, travel companies. Just uh, you have conventions that are being cancelled, meetings that are being cancelled. Some airlines say they've stepped up cleaning procedures on planes, but some travellers are taking extra precautions anyway. Yeah, so normally you wouldn't bring masks with you on a trip, no, but this time... Not. No, of course not, exactly. But right now, like, we heard a couple cases here in the airport, and, and that's it. So we just want to make sure that we're safe also. With the situation changing daily, the Canadian government says travellers should check advisories for their destination before they leave. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. Right now, the U.S. is refusing entry to people who have been in China or Iran in the previous two weeks. And today we learned Canadians are the ones being stopped most, at least 113 of them so far. The next biggest group at 90, Chinese citizens. Here's some of the other stories we're watching across Canada tonight. After nearly a month, two railway blockades in Quebec were taken down today. Mohawk protesters moved to a nearby site away from the tracks. Meanwhile, a second barricade near the Quebec-New Brunswick border was also dismantled. Both had been set up in support of the Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs in B.C. Protesters say the move is a gesture of good faith, but they will be standing by should further action be required. And newly released court documents reveal that the driver of a van, man accused of killing 10 people and injuring 16 others on a busy Toronto sidewalk, actually admitted to planning and carrying out the 2018 attack. The admission by Alex Manassian came after he was arrested when he was answering questions from the booking officer. 
Manassian's defense concedes he made the statement, but according to those documents, are seeking to have it ruled inadmissible because his right to remain silent was violated. His trial is scheduled to begin next month in front of a judge with no jury. And one of Canada's most prominent conservatives has thrown his support behind Aaron O'Toole's bid to be the next Tory leader. In an email to all Conservative Party members, Alberta Premier Jason Kenney highlighted several reasons for backing O'Toole, including his bilingualism and his understanding of Western Canadian issues. O'Toole is considered a front-runner for the top job alongside Peter McKay, whose leadership campaign has reportedly raised upwards of a million dollars. Rosemary is away this week, but at issue will be back next Thursday when we come back searching for a new normal six months after Hurricane Dorian. How one school is rebuilding and remembering a Canadian teacher. But first. I had a suitcase, a big garbage bag full of clothes, and $300. More on Canada's domestic violence crisis and how to find longer-term solutions for women fleeing abuse. We'll be right back. Welcome back to The National and our special series on intimate partner violence in Canada, a problem both shockingly widespread and dangerously underreported. Every year in this country, tens of thousands of domestic violence victims look for help and many don't get it, then return to patterns of manipulation, violence, sexual assault. Sometimes ending in murder. It affects every corner of Canadian life from newcomers to small-town neighbours to wealthy professionals. For months, CBC News and Radio Canada closely examined intimate partner violence in cities all across this country, how it starts, how police and governments respond, and why, despite a desire to help, society so often fails to do so. Well, tonight we share those findings with a special focus on intervention and understanding. So one thing we found almost universally across the country, shelters are overwhelmed and understaffed. And in the north, they're in dangerously short supply. 14 shelters in a region spanning some 3.5 million square kilometers with few roads. For one in three victims, safety is at least 100 kilometers away. Kate Kyle looks at the immense challenges of starting over when escape itself could be deadly. Remote and vast, this is the landscape that surrounds Canada's northern communities. For those experiencing violence, the isolation is that much greater. For some, help can be that much further away. And these are pictures of my oldest son, Akecho. Me and him have been through a lot together, through all the bad stuff in our life. This is my dad and my son, Eli, and Akecho. In her living room in Aklavik, Northwest Territories, Clarissa Gordon is far from her former abuser. These images bring back some of those memories. While pregnant, she was assaulted in front of her six-year-old son in Yellowknife. He was like, Mom, he was like, I got really scared. Uh, I thought he was going to kill you. And he started crying. And he said, oh, he, was like, he was like, I can't lose you. And it was at that moment when I was... Uh, and I was like, what am I doing? She worried if she stayed, her fear would continue. She ended up in a clavic, far enough to feel safe. I had to change everything if I wanted a different life. Leaving can be even more difficult for some women. The only way out of the community in the wintertime is by plane or driving on an ice road like this one. The nearest community is hours away. There's no cell service and there's nowhere to stop. One in three people in the territories is more than 100 kilometers away from a shelter. Women that we see most often are women without resources, without other places to go and without family support. This is where Lida Fuller is the executive director of the YWCA for the Northwest Charlotte. Territories. She says creating more um, shelters is complicated. Houses. She'd like to see more, Constantly but they are costly here. and housing is limited. It hasn't even been possible to protect the shelters we already have. If you can have an immediate option, that could save a life. Well, you wouldn't have to leave your home community. I heard an old, old story, how a savior came from glory. 
Clarissa prays for her family and strength, strength she now has to share her story. Now in a healthy relationship, she's hopeful about the future. I feel like a lot of this is hush hush, right? Nobody, nobody wants to talk about it. My son is seeing different. He's seeing what it's supposed to be like now. You know, there's still so much hope for him and for everybody. And she has greater hope for her community. Kate Kyle, CBC News, Aklavik Northwest Territories. Clarissa was able to start over, but every month almost 19,000 others are turned away from packed crisis shelters. And without the affordable housing of second stage shelters, many who do get in only return to their abusers. Bonnie Allen looks at the desperate need for that longer term support. Sarah Welsh says her husband was so controlling he installed a GPS tracker on her cell phone. He would track me. If I ever turned it off, I would be in trouble. But the stay-at-home mom was also scared she'd end up homeless. So when I left, I had a suitcase, a big garbage bag full of clothes, and $300. Sit, buddy. Welsh was lucky enough to get a spot in a crisis shelter, but the clock was ticking. She could only stay a month, and she did not have a safe, affordable place to go. When women leave abusive relationships, sometimes people think, oh, well, that's it, she's fine, she's on her own. doesn't work like that at all. Uh, women, after they've left, are actually at the highest risk of being killed. That's where second stage shelters come in. Not only is there security. This is an example of one of our suites. There's also counselling and support services. Women pay subsidized rent in apartment style units and can stay up to two years. And they can recover from the trauma of the violence that they've experienced both for themselves and for their children so that they can move on to full independence. CBC's research has revealed second stage shelters are turning away abused women and children thousands of times a month and the calls never stop. It's creating a bottleneck in emergency shelters which are turning away even more. The longer one woman stays, the fewer women can get in. There is a possible solution. The federal government is back in the business of housing. The National Housing Strategy is offering up money to buy or build shelter spaces. So that women aren't left vulnerable and without a safe place to call home. But there's a problem. Shelters say they cannot tap into that federal money because provincial and territorial funding to actually run the shelters with staff and programs can be inconsistent or non-existent. As for Sarah Welsh, she spent two years in a second stage shelter. You know, there is a life ahead of me. Now she's found her own place, a job and a sense of peace. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Regina. If you need help and are in immediate danger, of course, call 911. To find assistance in your area, go online. You can visit cbc.ca slash stopping domestic violence, endingviolencecanada.org or sheltersafe.ca. When our series on intimate partner violence continues, a suggestion of solutions, how entire communities can become protective shields. Tomorrow on the national inside Prince Edward Island's Circles of Safety. My name is Kelly McCauley. I was in an abusive relationship for 20 years and survived. I wasn't safe, I was scared I was gonna die. Circles of Safety helps protect women who are at high risk of being killed by their partners. You're a brave girl. Thank you. Being safe has taken on an entirely different meaning. Those poor women, they didn't deserve to die. And I got a second chance. Still ahead, we are on the ground in the Bahamas six months after Dorian, where the students from one school are learning, reading, writing, and rebuilding their lives. And Harry and Meghan together in public for one of their last official engagements as royals. Exactly six months after Hurricane Dorian tore through the Bahamas, the islands are rebuilding slowly. And while many schools have been destroyed, the desire to learn persists. David Common shows us. Lift up your head to How do you make things seem normal when they're anything but? The national anthem to start the school day? Sure, but the classroom is the teacher's home. 
waving high. Let's try you again. What is today's day? The desk, a dining room table. The class, a fraction of what it once was. Okay, what about singular and plural nouns? What's a singular noun? To understand why, you need to step outside. Up the road where most students live or lived. Their neighborhoods largely leveled here on Great Abaco Island by last year's Hurricane Dorian. So many schools were destroyed, many kids have nowhere to go. There you go. Write your alphabets for me. Just practice writing your letters. There's your so teacher Katrinka Kwashi has opened up her own home. He was largely spared by the storm, but for so many other students left idle, the entire school year could be lost. They want to be in school, and they want to be with their other uh, the students. This school has been a safe haven for these kids. It's not just school these kids have lost. One of their teachers, a Canadian, died in the storm. Alicia Leoli was from LaSalle, Ontario, just outside Windsor. She'd lived on Great Abaco for a few years, becoming immersed in life at the school called Every Child Counts, a haven for special needs kids. Meeting her fiance, the couple welcoming a son, and his mother, fallen in love with the island, choosing not just to remain, but to make a difference here. She was just a joy to be around. She really knew what she wanted to do out there. You know, and we're gonna definitely continue doing that in her honor. She was very driven and, you know, just very passionate. So this is where the primary school was. Um, Nicole Denarden worked alongside Alicia yes. and now helps oversee the reconstruction of the school. Okay, so this is one of our, um, was a classroom and will continue to be a classroom. Winds shaved the roof off of most of the buildings here, followed by surging water which filled classrooms to the ceiling. A tremendous loss, though rebuilding provides an opportunity. It feels like a blank slate that we can really make it the way we want to. Um, and knowing that it's coming back for our kids means a lot. So it's, it's I'm glad to be here. You can feel some hope in yes. the aftermath of a tragedy. Yes, I'm really happy to be here. Run by Alicia Leoli, it leads students into a brighter, more independent future. It's not just about restoring the school, but also resurrecting Alicia's project. Her passion for the program evident in this school video featuring her. The support we've received from the community thus far has been absolutely outstanding. We a transitional really program for developmentally challenged adults, giving them a place to live and employment. In the end, there's a place for everyone, there's a job for everybody. Alicia was part of that, it was her passion, you know, kind of be the end goal for providing a home, providing a space that is their own, you know, independent living. So, this would have been somewhere for people to live. Yes. Progress still is steady, yes. thanks to an okay. army of volunteer builders. Though the school still needs money to finish, it's a big task. Try the shorter ones first. The aim is to have these students and all those displaced by Dorian able to return in the fall, what will be a year since the hurricane's destructive impact. David Common, CBC News, Marsh Harbor in the Bahamas. Your cell phone bill could soon shrink. Today, the Trudeau government made good on a campaign promise. It dialed up Canada's three biggest wireless providers and gave them two years to slash their basic prices or else. I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's Daily News podcast, Front Burner, lessons from the U.S. response to COVID-19 and how they can be applied to Canada. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. You know this detail. Canadians pay some of the highest prices in the world for cell phone plans, up to 40% more than Americans in some cases. Now, as Jacqueline Hansen tells us, the federal government says it has a plan of its own to slash cell phone bills for nearly half of Canadians. 
You're not ready for my phone okay, bill. Wow. In Canada, big cell phone bills are easy to find. My monthly bill is usually around 250. I was paying almost 400 a month. The federal Liberals campaigned on making them cheaper. A re-elected Liberal government will cut cell phone bills by 25 percent. We also have transparency measures. Today, it's seeing that through. A government-imposed 25% price cut will apply to the big three carriers for plans of between 2 and 6 gigabytes. For example, the government says a 2 gigabyte plan that currently costs $50 per month would need to drop to $37.50. We anticipate this will benefit approximately 40% of Canadians. But in statements today, TELUS said it is extremely disappointing to see that the 25% decreases are limited to the national carriers. And Bell warned that policies discouraging investment, including regulating wireless pricing, put jobs and innovation at risk. But some consumer advocates believe Ottawa could have done more. Could they have done um, deeper cuts? Certainly. According to data released by the government today, prices have already been falling over the past couple of years. We expect them to be able to both handle these price reductions because they aren't really that difficult for them. And I don't believe they'll actually follow through and, and pull out their investments. And some Canadians' data demands already far exceed a six gigabyte plan. It's two to six gigs doesn't even sound like it. I would imagine that most people are, especially in the streaming world, going to be over that number. If the carriers don't meet the targets within two years, the government says it will consider other options, including taking steps to increase competition. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. Well, here are some of the other stories making headlines tonight. I guarantee I will stay in the fight for the hardworking folks across this country who have gotten the short end of the stick. Elizabeth Warren is dropping out of the presidential race. Warren did poorly in the Super Tuesday primaries, even finishing third in her own state of Massachusetts. For the time being, she says she's not ready to endorse, though, any of the remaining candidates. Official results are in for Israel's election, and once again, no party has enough seats for a majority. Prime Minister Netanyahu had declared a huge victory on election night when exit polls showed his supporters on the cusp of taking control. But today's results show he and his allies fell short, signaling more uncertainty. This was the country's third election in less than a year. The last two ended in a deadlock when no coalition was achieved. A British court has found the billionaire ruler of Dubai orchestrated the abductions of his two daughters and subjected his ex-wife to a campaign of intimidation. The ruling by Britain's High Court is part of a high-profile custody battle between Sheikh Mohammed Al Maktoum and Princess Haya. She has been living in England with their two young children after fleeing Dubai in fear last year. The Sheikh tried to keep the judgment sealed, but the court ruled today it was in the public interest to release it. And the Duke and Duchess of Sussex were back in London today, their last week of official appearances as royals. The event honoured sick and wounded servicemen and women. Harry and Meghan will stop all royal duties at the end of the month so that they can pursue a new life independent of the crown in North America. After the break, he wanted 100 cards for his 100th birthday. That's not exactly what happened. What really went on in honour of the Second World War vet. That's next in our moment. So this is Fred Arsenault, and I don't think we're related, but he is turning 100 tomorrow. The Second World War vet loves getting letters, and as you can see here, he was hoping to receive 100 of them for his 100th birthday. Well, mission accomplished, and then some. Today at his birthday party, the big reveal, that is our moment. This is going to be a big number, Dad, but it's not quite as big as your age. There's more coming, I'm sure. More coming. Yeah. Wow. Well, we actually asked for 100 cards for my friends on Facebook. It's gone across the world. We've received boxes with 700 cards in one box. We knew this was going to be big, but. I think it got a little bigger than we anticipated. Because <laughs> it's been the same mailman that's bringing them all in. So, so far he's got over 90,000. 
Yeah, and he's still a big smile when he comes. I think it's great for Dad and the veterans, for all their comrades. We need to remember the ones that served, the ones that are serving now, and our future generation that will be serving. Thank you. You'll remember this for quite some time. Yeah, I would. You bet. <laughs> did, I, did, I, did I see that on yes, the card did. right now and, and hear that? 90,000. 90, card. The, uh, the best part, by the way, is that they actually say they're going to read every single nice. one. <laughs> That's a tall and task. And the mailman bow deserves, deserves something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so just so you know, Fred was a private in the Second World War. Uh, he took part in the Italian campaign and the liberation of the Netherlands. Huge anniversary of that coming up in May. And again, I don't know enough about my family to know if we're related, <laughs> but it would be an honor. That is a national for March the 5th. Good night. Good night.